Well, and I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for putting me right after Thomas, because the very first thing that I'll talk about is a good follow-up um, to what he was talking about. So I'm Lauren Marshall. I'm professor of learning sciences at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was trained as a cognitive psychologist. So that means I was trained in how the brain works. And in particular, I focus on learning and computer science education. So today I'm going to share a few things software developers should learn about learning. And this is part of a bigger paper that we have that has 10 things that software developers should learn about learning that will be published soon in Communications of the ACM. And my co-authors on that are Neil Brown from King's College London and Felina Hermans from Freie University in Amsterdam. And I wanted to start with who this talk is for, because this talk isn't for just students and junior engineers who have a lot of learning left to do. It's also for engineers who are learning a new tool or skill, which is pretty much everyone at some point. It's also for mentors who are working with junior mentees or who are teaching their team a new tool or skill. It's also for those involved in recruitment and hiring who want to hire people who will learn new tools and skills. And then it's also for developers of new tools who want people to learn how to use their tool. So all of these people could benefit from understanding how people learn and process new information. So the first tip I want to share is that experts reason and beginner or experts recognize and beginners reason, which reminds me of this Einstein quote, which is that it's not that I'm so smart. I just stay with the problems, problems for longer. And this highlights that the real difference between an unsolved problem and a solved problem is the amount of time that it takes to solve it. And the real difference in the amount of time it takes is your expertise. So an expert will look at a problem and they will match the problem as a whole or in large pieces to a problem they already know how to solve. Novices don't have this luxury of expertise, so they have to break down the problem into a lot more pieces, and this gives them what we call a larger problem-solving space. So there's a lot more unknowns, and a lot, for a lot more information that they're processing when they are solving a problem. So in Thomas's example that we just saw of a maze, a novice would have a very detailed maze where they could make a lot of wrong turns, and an expert would have just a few little things that they'd have to navigate. So for example, an expert might look at a problem and immediately recognize this needs a counting loop. Easy, done. A novice might look at the same problem and say, oh, does this need a loop or a conditional? And if it's a loop, what type of loop does it need? And once they pick a type of loop, what are the operators and expressions? So the real benefit of expertise is that it's narrowing down this problem solving space, saving you a ton of cognitive effort and letting you take in more information to solve problems. So for that counting loop, an expert might just see that it needs a counting loop and they might just create a counting loop. Whereas an expert or a novice might need to break that down into 10 different steps. Because another thing expertise gives you is it automates a lot of low level skills that allows you to jump straight up to higher order skills. So the takeaway is that if beginners can't do something now, it doesn't mean that they'll never be able to do it, but they do need to practice solving problems to identify patterns and to practice the component steps so that they can automate them. And this connects to the next tip, which is that predictors of programming ability are unclear. So expanding on the last takeaway that just because you can't do something now doesn't mean you'll never be able to do it. We're also not that great at predicting what you will eventually be able to do. So there's two sorts of mindsets when we're trying to predict programming ability. There's the aptitude mindset that says you were born with it. And if you're not good at programming, you'll never be good at programming no matter how much you practice. The other side of that is the practice mindset, which is as long as you practice and put enough effort in, you can do anything that you want. Of course, neither of these extreme views is correct. So while it is true that pretty much anyone could pass an introductory physics class with enough practice and effort, it's also true that practically no one is going to get a Nobel Prize in physics, no matter how much they practice. So the real answer lies somewhere in the middle. And we're going to put aside practice for now, because that's sort of something that we can manipulate and deal with after the fact. So what we try to do, especially when we hire people, is we try to predict aptitude. However, we're really, really bad at it. 
So some failed predictors of aptitude are your prior experience. So what you can do now, the programming languages that you already know, your prior math experience, none of these are good predictors of aptitude. Personal characteristics like race, gender, age, or your perception of CS are also bad predictors of aptitude. Even your preferences, so what your academic major is or was, or whether you consider yourself a humanities or a science person, these are not pre good predictors of your ultimate programming ability. The best predictors that we have are general intelligence and working memory capacity, which is how much information you can process at once. However, these aren't really good predictors of aptitude. They're better predictors at the rate at which you will learn. So the takeaway from this tip is that many of the perceived predictors of programming aptitude that we have actually have no empirical evidence. And to me, this says that when we're trying to measure aptitude, aptitude is not the limiting factor, actually. Practice is the limiting factor. So there might be some edge cases where you're trying to hire a CEO that maybe you should look at prior experience, but based on uh, what most of the hiring situations are, none of these predictors are really good at predicting aptitude. The next tip is that understanding a concept goes from abstract to concrete and then back again. So I think everyone's had this uh, example where someone explains something to you and it goes completely over your head. So a good strategy when that happens is you say, could you give me an example? And this scenario represents this constant tension between experts and novices because experts want to describe a concept in an abstract way that allows you to solve a lot of different problems. I mean, they really do mean well. But when you're a novice and you don't have any concrete examples that you can connect to that abstract concept, you don't have any idea what they're talking about. And in effect, you can solve absolutely no problems. So the takeaway is that you should cycle between these abstract concepts and concrete examples and able to be able to learn way, concepts in a way that allows you to solve different problems. So this means that experts need to provide abstract explanations as well as concrete examples. And then novices need to be able to interrogate concepts that they don't understand, collect a bunch of concrete examples, and therefore find the underlying principles that allow them to solve a wider range of problems. There is sort of a tension in the field of whether you should start with abstract or start with concrete. My rule of thumb is the more novice a person is, the more you should start with concrete examples and move to abstract compared to the other way around. And then the last tip I'll talk about is that the internet and AI have not made learning obsolete, unfortunately. So we've had this de debate before when the internet came along and suddenly you can find all the documentation that you want at your fingertips. You didn't have to go searching through manuals. We thought this would make programming so easy, but it didn't. And so the real debate is what is the role of the internet, of AI and other tools and what is the role of just good old-fashioned learning? So the internet and generative AI, like Codex or Copilot, they're really good at low-level details, but using them has a cost. So the first cost is task switching. So when you're using Copilot to write code, you're both writing code, evaluating what Copilot's giving you, and then the other task is switching between these two different types of tasks. You can get better at this, and tools can make it more seamless, but it still has a cost. The major cost, however, is that when you're offloading information to AI and you don't have those low-level skills practiced, then you're not enabling yourself to do higher order skills. Like we talked about with the first tip, you have to practice those low-level skills in order to automate them and unlock higher order skills. So AI is really good at predicting code for a very predictable situation. But right now, it's not good at a lot of things like creativity, dealing with uncertainty, or making a code base that's maintainable and debuggable. So we need to still be learning those low-level skills so that the programmer who has to do those tasks can then do those tasks. So the takeaway is that developers still need to learn the conceptual information that's offloaded to tools. 
And then as a summary, what can you do to support learning? If you're a learner, make sure that you're practicing problems to identify and apply patterns. For hirers, make sure that you're considering how you're trying to predict programming aptitude. If you're trying to predict programming aptitude, especially given that we don't have good research about how to do that. For mentors, make sure you're providing concrete examples with abstract concepts. Mentees, make sure that you're aggregating examples to discover those underlying principles. And then everyone, make sure that you understand the low-level skills that you're asking AI to do. And if you want a book-long treatment of these sorts of things and a lot of others, I recommend The Programmer's Brain by Felina Hermans, one of my co-authors. And if you want just a article-long treatment, we do have a paper coming soon to Communications of the ACM that has 10 tips, and it will be open source that anyone can access it. And in the meantime, there is my email address. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Applause as if I'm the entire audience. Um, I, again, such great, fantastic talks that are happening today. And I think the learning piece here, especially appreciate you bringing in the learning technologies and the really, well, I call them learning technologies because it seems like that's where we're headed with a lot of these inevitably. Um, and so I think labeling us, that seems appropriate. I kind of have a question pertaining specifically to that component. Right. Um, so like the idea that that AI would replace learning feels right like that that should not be the case, obviously. But like, what do you have to say about the kind of complementary nature that might be there? So you're talking about concrete to abstract, abstract to concrete. Is there a role that these technologies can play such that we don't feel like we're using them as a crutch, but that they're more of an aid in the learning process? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, and so one of my favorite tools in learning is the use of analogies. So if you can ask a pro an AI to solve a problem that's basically the same, but has different surface level features, then you can compare those three, you know, say you asked it to solve three different problems, you can compare those three to get to those underlying principles. So you can use that as a tool to look at the differences and similarities and connect that to, well, this feature is common across them. So that must be an important feature of solving problems like this, whereas this one's very specific to a certain type of problem. So that doesn't really need to be uh, part of what I learn. Oh, I think you're muted, Brittany. I am. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so we're getting some great, uh, some great things. We see someone really enjoyed the session here. Fantastic session. Um, are there any other questions that folks have? And again, you know, I see Lauren is in the Slack, so feel free to tag her if you have questions there. I do have one that came through here. Uh, how do we get professors to learn about learning? How do we get the ones that are responsible for helping with the learning to understand learning? Oh, that's a good one, Greg. Please. I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> but we are working, but some more and more people are getting interested in it. Um, and we are, it's also events like these help translate that into a way that is accessible to a practitioner because it's one thing to want to improve your teaching, it's another thing to have to become a computer science education researcher to understand what's going on and improve your teaching. So the more that the researchers can talk to the practitioners, the better.